All right. Welcome. Welcome to this Lunch and Learn on effective videos in courses, how we can make them and how we can use them. And uh, this particular session has been informed from the Student Voices panel because when we interviewed students, we received feedback that they really enjoy the videos that their instructors make. And they talked to us a little bit about the types of videos that they enjoy and the characteristics that they enjoy. And I've also gone into some research too to find a stat foundation. We're gonna start off with kind of the concepts of the what and the why, and then Adrian's going to take us into the how. So we're going to cover all of those things today. Let's go ahead and get into this. There we go. <laughs> Creating effective videos. So there are four steps according to research by DePaulo and Associates. There are four steps in video creation. Step one is the planning stage. And then we have step two, development. Step three, delivery. And step four, reflection. And we're going to talk about those in a little more detail. So the first step is step one is planning. When you have considerations for planning, you're thinking about what is your intent of the video? Why are you making this video? What are you trying to accomplish with this? This is the same thing when we write lesson plans, when we're trying to figure out what are our objectives and why are we doing this? You also need to consider your available technology. What do you have available to you? What can you accomplish with the video? Uh, you'll think about the length of the video, the appropriate length and the social presence. Let's dive into length and social presence a little bit more. For length, research has shown that one to 10 minutes seem to be ideal for a video, depending upon the topic. Uh, if you have six minutes or fewer in your video, that seems to be ideal in some research that was associated with assessments for students remembering that information. However, we have to remember that there are limitations to the settings for these studies. Um, so the six minutes is just an approximation. If you have a longer video, it is better to have that video. It seems to be better if you have it cut into segments. So kind of chunking that video. And you might do that through YouTube if you went to the recent coffee talk uh, that talked to you about creating chapters in your YouTube videos. It's with those minute markers to let students know, well, at this minute, I'm talking about this. At this minute, we're talking about that. Or you might just cut your videos into pieces so that you have a part one, a part two, a part three, whichever is easiest for you and makes the most sense for your students. And the whole reason to do that is to avoid the cognitive overload. And if you went to the college-wide um, PD last week, we talked a lot about cognitive overload. We want to be able to present the information in palatable chunks for students so that they can retain that information longer. And then the other side of that is the instructor social presence. And I really did wanna focus in on this. Uh, research shows that when you use video, that's, that presents a richness in your communication that's not available in say audio only or in text only. And really video is the closest you can get to face-to-face. -to -face. That's what that F2F means. That's the closest you can get to that face-to-face. -face. Um, and when you're creating these videos, it helps develop your community in your classroom as well. When you have a strong instructor presence, then that contributes to student attitude in the course, which includes their motivation, the retention of those students, and can feed into their achievement. But again, you wanna make sure that those videos are effective videos. You wanna make sure that they're brief and they're well-designed. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that too. Step two is development. Some considerations in the development are the script and purpose. Now script, especially when I was conducting research, when I was interviewing instructors, they talked a lot about developing a script, but we also have to think um, they said their main, there were two main reasons they did it. Uh, one of them was for captioning because then they could upload the script and it was exactly what they said to the captioning. However, if you're using uh, things like YouTube or Vimeo or Stream, there's a lot of auto captioning even in Zoom 
that can occur. And then all you're doing is editing the captions for capitalization, punctuation, maybe correct spelling if you've used a, a term, a vocabulary word that's specific to your department or your discipline. But the script, the second reason is also to basically have the idea of what you're going to say. Sometimes a script can be talking points or can be verbatim, but be careful about reading that script exactly, uh, especially in a robot fashion, because then you might lose your students because it's too rigid. They still want to see you as a real person. They want to feel like you're talking to them. And that reminds me, one of the ideas that people had to help be a little more personable in their videos is they might have a stuffed animal or a pet nearby, and they would pretend to deliver the video when it was asynchronous. They would depend, pretend to deliver the video to that stuffed animal or to that pet so that they could inject a little bit more personality or interest. And you also wanna think about the purpose for your video. Let's talk a little bit more about purpose. You might have a purpose for your video to introduce yourself and introduce students, or to introduce the units, introduce the module, whatever terminology you'd like to use. You might also use your video for modeling. So it's to be able to show and tell, or to be able to role play, to demonstrate how they can do something, accomplish something in your course. Maybe it's a lab. You might explain with your video difficult concepts, help connect two ideas together. And of course you can use it for lecturing. And then finally, your purpose for your video might be for feedback or feed forward. Those are two different things. Feedback is when you're talking to students about their current performance on an assessment, on an assignment. You're talking to them, how did they do right now? And feed forward is helping them recognize how they can use these ideas that you've given them or the strengths that they have represented in future endeavors. So you wanna have a nice balance of that. Unfortunately, uh, because that transfer of knowledge is a little bit higher level, sometimes you need to help students with recognizing the transparency between your feedback and really helping them understand how they can use that to feed forward to improve their performance. So that's a thought. Hmm. Any questions so far? Okay, so then we wanna think about step three and in step three, that's your delivery. In your delivery, you can use your video for a flipped classroom, which is not really the same as flipped learning. Uh, if you've heard that term before, flipped learning is more, um, more concerted. Whereas flipped classroom might just be, you'd like them to watch this explanatory video before they come to your Zoom classroom or before they come to your lab so that they have some background that they bring with them. But you can also make your videos interactive. We have a couple of sources for interactive videos at Delaware Tech. We can access Edpuzzle with a Delaware Tech membership. And in Edpuzzle, really what you're doing, you're taking a video, maybe it's one that you created, maybe it's one that you found on YouTube, you've found this video or you've created this video and you can in, um, inject questions into the video or stopping points into the video, which is nice because we talked about those longer videos and chunking those. So we might be able to use those uh, and puzzle videos to also enact that chunking. Um, and we would put in say a multiple choice answer, a question, or maybe a short answer. You could put in a voiceover. You could put in a note that you want to help explain something. If it was a video you found on YouTube that wasn't quite enough and you wanted to add some thoughts. And of course, your own video to make that interactive. We also have ThingLink as an option. Uh, Delaware, you have a Delaware Tech membership there as well. And one of the ways you can use those interactions are, for instance, label 360 degree videos. In a 360 degree video, it's just like you're in the situation and you're turning in that situation and looking. And for instance, some instructors have created uh, interactive 360 degree uh, tours of a lab space or of a medical room or of an ambulance. They've created these 360 degree videos or of a kitchen. 
uh, and put in their labels that can help explain what the students are seeing. So those are two things. And again, we have uh, memberships to those and we've had a couple of lunch and learns for Edpuzzle and ThingLink and we've had some coffee talks. In fact, um, Edpuzzle is the current challenge for the Teach Champions in Coffee Talk. And uh, we'll be they'll be talking about that in the next Coffee Talk. All right. And then step four is reflection. And the consideration for that is evaluation. This is where you open yourself up to be a little bit vulnerable. You actually ask your students, how was my video? How did it work? How was this video? Did it help you? How could it be different that it could help you more? What were the things that you liked so I can make sure I do them again in future videos? So you might survey your students right there in D2L. You can have, you can create a survey that's not graded and it can be anonymous. They can give you feedback. Of course, you reflect upon that student feedback, determine if you have critical mass uh, for that feedback, for instance, that um, it would seem to mean a lot to a number of students. And then you make those revisions as necessary for future videos. And that's how you can make sure that your videos become even more effective because you're asking your audience, how did it go? Now we wanna talk a little bit about video creation. And we really wanna look at the simplicity of video creation through Zoom and the use of Zoom tools. And Adrian is going to walk you through that process. Yes, yes he is. Okay, good morning everybody. <laughs> Hope you all are doing well today. Charlene, you have no right to have that delicious pizza as your background, it must be changed right away. Can't believe you came in here with that nonsense. I'm hungry. <laughs> Kelly already Kelly already bragged that she had soup. And we're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. she's so great. You have to, uh, mm, yeah, there it is. All right, all right. Uh, okay, no, we're not spotlighting the pizza. No, go away. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about some things here. Actually, ironically enough, we'll go ahead and share pizza to start with. Um, so you can see. If you want to do a Zoom recording, we recommend you record to the cloud, um, especially if you're on campus, but just in general, it's easier for sharing. It's, it's, you get some caption files that are created for you, which you can get on the, on the desktop side as well, but there's some settings and things that you can change that I'm going to talk about that make recording to the cloud really the best uh, place to be able to do that. So we do recommend you record to the cloud. The way you can do that is down here, if we were not recording, there'd be a record button. You hit that record button, it will give you the option to record to your desktop or to the cloud and go ahead and you would select cloud, All right? So once you do that and you've started recording, there's a couple of different things that you can uh, set up and considerations that you can have with those recordings. So right now I'm logged in to, um, yeah, favorite pizza topic. That's a great icebreaker, I love that. Um, Right now, you can see that I'm logged into my uh, DTCC Zoom account. All right, and so if you you have not done that, it's you simply go to dtcc.zoom.us, um, and then you click the sign in button right here. And if you've already authenticated on the portal for the day, you should just be automatically dropped into your Zoom account. If you haven't, then you'll be taken to the portal to log in that login page that we're all very very familiar with. Um, and then you'll log in and it drops you here. So two areas we're gonna talk about real quick. The first one is settings, all right? And so this is how you can set up different uh, aspects of your recording. And so you can see local recording. I wouldn't worry about this too much unless you're gonna do a lot of local recording, in which case definitely make sure you save that closed caption as a VTT file. Um, VTT files are recognized by YouTube as a captioning file. So you can take the caption file that was created when you were recording and use that in YouTube. But you can actually edit the VTT file using something like Notepad um, or on the Mac, I think it's, what is it on the text edit maybe, I think on the Mac is what it's called. It's been a while since I've opened it on a Mac computer. But you can use just those basic text editors to edit that VTT file. And you'll actually see like the um, minute markers. 
So if you remember around the time you were saying a particularly complex word, or maybe your speech wasn't as clear as you had hoped, this is your opportunity before you ever upload it. You can just download that VTT file and make those edits and then upload it to YouTube. So that's super great to have that file. But you can see here, we have different options for cloud recording. We can record active speaker with shared screen, we can record gallery view with shared screen, or we can record the active speaker gallery view and shared screen all separately. All right. So if you don't want to have to go in and change your settings every single time you want to do a different kind of video, then I would just check it all and click save. All right. So advantages and disadvantages to all of these things. If you record after active speaker with shared screen, then at least when you have, when you're not sharing your screen, students will see an image of you, right? Or whoever is actively speaking at that time. When you are sharing screen, it will show off to the side that active speaker, all right? But the shared screen will be the focus of that. If you record gallery view with shared screen, you're gonna see a list of people over on the right-hand side and that will be dynamic based off of who's been speaking and where they are on that list. And that will change throughout the time of the recording. And the, re and the shared screen will be off uh, to the side as the main focus when the shared screen is present. But if you record after speaker, gallery view, and shared screen separately, then what you end up doing is you have three different videos. You have a video of just the speaker. And again, that can change depending on who the active speaker is if you're in a class situation. Right, so if a student answers a question, all of a sudden they become the active speaker. Um, you would have a picture of the gallery view, so that's just everyone that can be seen inside the gallery. Um, this can be great if you want to have a little like check to see who might have been there, who was jumping in and out, who was present. There's a list of participation, but you can also see by looking at that gallery view, that's another way to see everyone that was there. And then the shared screen, this will just record the shared screen separately from everything else. The reason this is nice is that you may share your screen during a class period and you're explaining a particularly difficult topic. And at the end of that, you realize, man, I nailed it. That was the best I've ever done at explaining that. That was incredible. I want to save that and use that. But you can't use it in all of your courses if there's identifiable student information that's part of that recording. So if all you did was record actor speaker with shared screen and a student asked a question in the middle of your explanation, which was why it was so great because they asked a really great question at a really great time. Now that student's identifiable information is up on the screen because they were the active speaker, right? So now you can't use that in multiple classes, right? Um, and that's why if we record it separately, right, we can have just the shared screen part of it and the student voice will be heard, but there's no identifiable information. So we can actually use that across multiple instances. So my recommendation, there's not really a size limit, um, a space, there's not a storage limit that I've been made aware of. There is a time limit that I am definitely aware of inside of Zoom, right? You can only have your recordings for 120 days. So before that 120 day mark, definitely if that's something you wanna archive and save, you wanna transfer that to YouTube, which there's a whole reference guide about using YouTube. And there's lots of great videos out there about how to take your Zoom recording and move it over into YouTube. So that's definitely something you can do. And that way you can save this and you save this in all different ways. So what does this look like? Well, I did a quick test recording and it's gonna be wonderful and magnificent and amazing because I'm teaching this. So it's gonna be the greatest recording you've ever seen. So don't, don't before we start, don't be jealous, okay? That's just the only thing I wanna say, all right? Don't, this, no one's expecting Hollywood quality, okay? It'll be fine. But so you can see speaker view, right? It's literally, for the whole time, no matter where I jump in, even here where I'm sharing my screen, all you see is me, right? This is the worst, don't do that. Nobody wants to say, okay, let's close that video now, great. All right, let's go to the shared screen version. So what you'll see here is the shared screen version. Let me go ahead and use this. It doesn't show anything 
until I actually share my screen, at which point now you can see the screen. So this is an important thing to remember about recording the shared screen version of, of a video, is that if you're not sharing your screen, then there is nothing there. So if you're going to have a whole bunch of blank time, then you probably don't want to do this. Now, obviously, this would be a situation where you might be explaining a concept outside of class, right? Maybe you have a video that you want to make, and it's you sitting down in front of a piece of software, in front of a blank screen, in front of a, a word problem, whatever. And you're going to be working through that out loud so that the students can see what, what you're talking about or explain a particularly difficult concept. That's when having that setting that records both the, um, both the live speaker and shared screen is great, all right? Because at least they see you and then you can always trim what it is that students see when it's shared. So if we go to the recordings and we click this recording right here, Right, I can pause this real quick. I can trim, and you can see I've already done some trimming here. I've trimmed the first four seconds off and the last, I think three or four seconds, yeah, three seconds off the end. But I can go ahead and I can move this one second at a time. To the point where I've shown my screen and then I can back this up to right before when I'm done sharing my screen and click save. So now instead of you know 20 plus seconds of some usefulness or a big chunk of not useful, chunk of useful, another chunk of not useful, when I share this out now, it's just me sharing the screen. It's just that part, that's all that's seen, right? So that can be really great. These should not, and Laura mentioned this, these should not be professional videos, right? Your, your students are not expecting you to be in a studio environment with a green screen behind you and the best microphone you've ever seen in the whole daggone world with the perfectly written script that's going to win some Emmy, Tony, Globe, Globe. I don't even know what wins what because I just don't care. But whatever you can win for that kind of thing, right? It's what they want is, is you. As much as this might be, like, as much as their behavior might suggest otherwise from time to time, right? What they actually want is you as, as a person, right? They don't necessarily want a polished product. They want to feel like you understand what it is that they're struggling with and that they see you caring about their struggles or caring to explain something to them. So you don't have to do 15 takes because you messed up one time, right? If you have a mistake that isn't negatively affecting the overall goal of the video, you can just keep going. It'll be fine, right? It's a human aspect to that video. If it's funny, even better, because then the students, like they'll laugh, they won't feel as self-conscious about needing to watch the video, right? We talked about this, um, the other day in, a, in one of the courses that I'm teaching, we as instructors should be willing to be the most ridiculous person in that room and make the biggest embarrassment of ourselves. That way, nobody else feels like that's them um, because they're more comfortable. And that's true with the video as well. You should, you know, it should be helpful, informative, but it should also be engaging, right? And one of the best ways to engage is humor, right? Everybody loves laughing. Everybody that's, and, and you remember it more, right? If you go back into the class the next day and you made four perfect videos and one video where you made a mess up and it was hilarious and everybody loved it, guess which video everybody remembered? It was the one where you, it was the hilarious one. It was the one where you messed up, right? That, that stuck because there was a, an emotion attached to it. So that's great. You know, you don't have to worry about that. When you're making your videos, I know that you were talking about being able to record uh, with the Zoom and how do you protect student identities. But if you're also making some of those introductory videos, some, some instructors have been surprised to know that you can just open a Zoom meeting where you are the only attendant and you can create these videos yourself right there. Um, some, some instructors were surprised 
that you could yeah. do that, that it didn't have to be a meeting with other people. So just to put yeah, that yeah, that's out a there. Great, yeah, that's a great point, Laura. In fact, what's great about uh, individual meetings is there's always consensus. Uh, so every, <laughs> you know what I mean? That might be the only Zoom meeting you have all day where everybody agrees. Um, and the, nice, the other nice thing about uh, individual Zoom meetings is that a lot of these screen recording software programs that we recommend, they do have time limits for the free versions of them. Uh, Zoom actually doesn't even for the free version if it's just you. So we wouldn't even have to have a Zoom Pro license, which we do, which allows us to have a class that lasts longer than 45 minutes or whatever the, the time limit is. But even if you had just an, in, so if you're just, you know, if you happen to have instructor friends who don't have Pro Zoom licenses, Zoom is still a great way to record because there is unlimited time if you're the only person in the meeting. You, it's, you can record for as long as you need to. Now, back to Laura's previously mentioned statement of videos of one to 10 minutes are best. <laughs> so this is not an encourage. This is not, we're not saying both things here. It's like two hours is great because Zoom lets you. No, um, it's just that you could do that. You, you know what I mean? Zoom doesn't have a time limit which is really nice. Um, yes, Tina, what were you gonna say? So if I wanted, like when I have my Zoom meetings with my class, you know, we'll go over the information. If I just want it to be my screen share and me, my face, not that I really want my face there, but it makes it more personal, right? right. Um, and of course students are asking questions, but I don't want their faces. Do I use the screen and at, which which one do I use? I'm confused. <laughs> that's so that's that's what's tricky about this is that as best as we can tell within the settings, um, it's active speaker. So it's not host. It's not spotlight. It's not any of that stuff, right? Like when you record, the the choice is active speaker. So if your student is the active speaker, then and that's the person that's going to be there. Now, there's some ways that you can, can get around this. Um, the first one, and I'll, I'll show you guys here. I'm going to share my screen back to being this soon. Um, the first thing that you can do when you share a screen, if you go to the advanced tab, you can use a PowerPoint slide as a virtual background, which is great. So if it's you and you're using PowerPoint, specifically PowerPoint, not just any presentation software. It has to specifically be PowerPoint at this point. You can have PowerPoint. What, what Zoom does is Zoom takes the PowerPoint and it brings the PowerPoint in as a bunch of flat image files. So that really cool animation thing with the lights that Laura had at the beginning of the session. Yeah, that's just going to be a static picture of you know wherever it decides to freeze. So if you have like things fly in from the side and text reveal and all that stuff, no, it's a flat file at that point because Zoom doesn't have the capability to do all of that stuff. What it's doing is it's bringing in PowerPoint as pictures and then setting them as a virtual background so that you can then be put into the virtual background. So if I do this, let me see if I can find, I don't even know if I have a PowerPoint here. That is I your head do. like real big in there or can you so that's like yeah i'm gonna water? i'm gonna try to show you what it looks like uh do, 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 do. yeah let's do let's do this because i don't think it's very long so here you go this is what it looks like and you can click your head and smack yourself on the forehead. Um, like a, weather, you can, a weatherman, you know? Yes. And you can make yourself as big as, as, as you're, to a point. Not, you know, the, the, it stops growing at a certain point. But you can also make yourself very, very tiny and sit yourself down here in the little corner. This probably doesn't achieve what you want. Um, this also probably doesn't achieve what you want. So it's somewhere in between. Um, you have to consider your PowerPoint design a little bit when you're doing this because you want to make sure you leave yourself dead space as a place to exist so it might be like and i don't even know as we go through this so how for instance this was that? what's that how are you moving around what, what are you doing to do that this i'm yeah. literally just dragging and dropping myself i literally click on my picture and just drag and drop it anywhere like again this is probably not ideal but anywhere that's ideal you can see that here 
And so this, this was demonstrating this is supposed to be a GIF. And so this is what it does. This motion GIF just freezes out and it doesn't do anything. Just like Lara's lights would just stay stationary. They wouldn't show, right? But see here, like I'm finding, okay, maybe, and this is why it's important to like test this stuff ahead of time. Maybe the best spot for me in this presentation, no, it's probably not there. I think back here, it makes sense. Let's see, mm, see, this is tricky. See, this was not designed with this in mind. So you definitely want to think about that and think about your PowerPoint design. It's not the worst. All right. And you make yourself translucent, kind of like a ghost. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> but it's actually. I mean, yes, I it's actually... but then you could just share the PowerPoint. <laughs> I think it's actually engaging, though, to have you move around because it's kind of like that presentation on Friday with Michael Flynn, where he's like, you know, the basketball game where, you know, you're moving Good the point. camera versus the one where you're just sitting still. Yes. So th I thought was, when you had your chart there, Adrian, it would be neat to put yourself towards the places where you wanted students to focus attention. Yes, I could be like, you could go here and here and here and here. Um, yeah, there's definitely, so we're, we're not getting into this, Laura, I promise, because we promised that we would not get into this today. But if you've, if you've been to previous sessions where we've talked about all the cool things that you can do in Zoom with creating videos and all that stuff, you have potentially heard me mention software called OBS. And OBS would allow you to create scenes that would, that would then, like you could change the scene so that your camera would actually move from like, as you switch to a new PowerPoint slide, you could also change your scene so that you moved your camera within the PowerPoint slide. It's complicated, very cool, also very free. If you wanna learn more about doing that awesome kind of fun stuff, which I, I don't know for sure if that's what Mike Flynn was using uh, for his presentation, if he was using OBS or not, uh, but that is definitely what he was doing is something that can be done inside of OBS. Um, so all of you could have a professional looking presentation like that, honestly, without it. it without the be, expensive equipment. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can help you out with all of that stuff if you want to go deep. Um, but yes, this is a way you could do it. So Tina, to your, to your question, this is one way you could do it. If you're using PowerPoint presentation, you put yourself in the slides by using, taking advantage of that screen share. And that way, if you just record the shared screen, it still records you because you're now part of the shared screen. And your students would be heard, right? But they would be, they wouldn't be act, like because you're not recording the active speaker, you're just recording shared screen, their faces, their images, their names, all that stuff wouldn't show up. The sound would show up, but you would stay on screen with the shared screen they would not appear or replace you. So. so the setting with that would be shared screen only. Shared screen only. Yep. This okay. would be shared screen only because at this point, my shared screen is embedding me into the shared screen by taking advantage of this particular setup. It's really weird because now like I'm in gallery view, I am active speaker and I am shared screen. I am all things. <laughs> oh, gosh. Your head's getting way too big. <laughs> No, no, wait, no, it's not. Wait, but it can. Look. <laughs> okay. All right. No, that's, that's helpful, though. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. That's enough of that ridiculousness. All right. The <laughs> last thing I do want to talk about is just there is, and, and this is going to be covered more in tall TV. So um, you can just do very basic share video feedback, right? So Laura mentioned feedback being one of those things. There is video feedback option inside of D2L. So I just wanted to very quickly, this is just a, a, a model assignment I have in my sandbox course. But the idea here is that when you come down here, there is a record audio and a record video option for giving feedback to students, right? There is a lot of time when even detailed feedback that can be given here doesn't necessarily communicate the human aspect of your feedback to a student, right? So being able to just very quickly record a video as feedback and just, you know, because maybe there's a lot of red marks over on the left, but overall you're actually happy with the progress the student is making. But red marks don't typically indicate 
happiness. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? And so, and even text on a page, you can say things like, wow, you've really come a long way. They'll be like, yeah, that's not what it looks like over there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but if you take the time to create a video and tell them, listen, I know it looks like a lot over there, but really I want you to know that I've seen tremendous growth between what you have been doing in the past and what you're doing now, right? This is stuff that I know is just going to elevate you to the next level and really make this a fantastic thing, right? That, you could type that nowhere near the effect of you recording a video that says that. And that video took 20 seconds. You know what I mean? Like that, and for that student, that would make all the difference in how they perceive what it is that's, what they received on that assignment and all those marks and what that represents, right? So it'd be world, world changing. And that's what's crazy about using video. And that's why our students made such a big deal about it on the panel is that something like that is 20 seconds worth of work, but makes it so much better. When you use it to describe assignments, right? If you create a one minute video that details where you're speaking to the students saying, this is what I want you to do for the assignment. And maybe you can even give them an example and you can explain it to them in ways that they can understand. You're gonna eliminate questions on the back side of that, which is always great. Less emails to answer, it's fantastic. And your students are just gonna, you're setting them up for success. They're gonna feel more confident going into whatever it is because you've taken just that little extra time to transfer what was written into a video that lets them see you, hear you, sense what it is that you want. They can really get that in a much better way. So Zoom is the great tool for doing that. To compliment what Adrian was saying, that's one of the real values too, is he said you're translating the written with a video and being able to have both of those options available, right? Because not everyone yeah. prefers a video, but there's a lot of people who do. But if you have that opportunity that they can read it, they can watch your video, you can even share a screen in a video so that you can describe the steps in detail. But having both of those available and um, a lot of our instructors use tabs, for instance, and they'll have a tab, you can read it, you can watch it. And so they have the, both of those available to lend it to the learning style or the preferred style that the student has. Yeah, absolutely. So, quick question. So where you just were, you know, in D2L, where the feedback is, if you click the record video and you had your marked up document there, is it, it's going to record all of that well, like, what's it going to record? Everything it's going to record just there? you. Just so, me. Okay. Yeah, so that's just going to be a video recording. So if you wanted to give, if you wanted to actually like go through the process of reviewing the document and then posting that, you can do that. Um, and what you would do is that you would use Zoom, right? And so you would, you would open a Zoom session, you would share a screen, you'd go in, obviously you'd make sure it was that student's work <laughs> that was up there that you were doing, right? <laughs> disclaimers um and then you would you would record the video here on zoom right and you could put a link actually it could be as simple as putting a link to your zoom video into the feedback area that says hey go here for video feedback that i've provided for you on this assignment right and so you can link you can share get the share link for zoom so that is pull this back over right so if you're in here in this recording right? You can get a shareable link right here. And if you want to share a particular one, the shared screen one, you can get that shareable link right here. All right. And then you can just click that. It copies it onto your clipboard and then you paste that into the, um, into this area. So if I go here and I do this, right, it pastes the link and it pastes, it pastes the passcode that they need. You can change whether or not you want to have passcodes or not for your recordings. That's one of the settings inside of Zoom. And then they can go there and they can see that recording. Or you can make the recording, save it to your computer, and then you can upload it as a file for them. And so they can see it that way as well. Um, the last option, I don't One know. One of the things we talked about, Adrian, before was the value of the cloud recording also. If yes. you don't have a lot of space on your machine 
or if you were on campus, those machines don't always have a lot of space because there's a lot of other things on the computer. Um, or if you saved it to your personal laptop at home, then you didn't have access to it when you were on campus. So saving it to the cloud provides you with that access and sharing that link allows students to be able to access it. If it's just particular to that, to that yeah. student, after 120 days, it's gone. Right. So it's okay. It, it just goes off on its own. Right. So that is definitely the easiest, simplest, smoothest way. If for some reason you wanted to do it, again, you could attach it as a file, or you could go in here to the insert stuff option and you can you can add in the video and upload it directly, and that will sort of embed it in here in the text area. So, but I, I'm not taking all the feedback stuff because that's coming up. You've got to wait, tell TV for more details. All right, find out next time. <laughs> tune in, tune in next week or, or whenever it is to find out more. Um, and if you want another tool for feedback, Flipgrid's really good too. Uh, you can see a past lunch and learn for that. Yes. All right. So any questions about creating these informative videos using Zoom, Zoom settings that you can have set up, ways that you can trick it, how you can be, you know, active speaker, gallery, and <laughs> then shared screen all simultaneously. Anything about that? Great. If you want to learn more about this or about, as I mentioned before, OBS and the, and the, and like super next level stuff you can do with creating videos and stuff like that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I can set up a time, hopefully to work with you, find out what it is that you would like to do and how it is that we can partner together to be able to make that work. But otherwise, Laura's going to wrap us up. Adrian and I would like to thank you very much for coming to this Lunch and Learn for effective videos and courses that was inspired and informed by our Student Voices panel. Thank you so much for coming today. We hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you, everyone.